I actually, I actually love, I actually love the ending because you did a presentation about data analytics, and actually you didn't really talk about data analytics. But, <laughs> but the reason, the reason I actually love this is data analytics is a how, the the what is important, and you and I, you and I know categorically that. Welcome to the Beyond Deadlines podcast, where we tackle challenges that planning and schedule leaders come across on a day-to-day -day basis. My name is Mike Pipo, and I'm a planning and scheduling manager for Intel. My name's Greg Lawton. I'm the CEO of an AI schedule management company called Nodes and Links. On this episode, we're going to cover data analytics and project management. For an upcoming presentation that I'm giving to some grad students, I've created some slides going over what is data analytics, how is it used in project management, and some of the future implications. So Greg, talk to me real quick about data analytics. Well, just in general, data analytics. <laughs> um, I, think, I think number one is whenever people have a conversation about this, they really need to start with definitions. Supply. I have those. I have those. I have in definitions. your presentation. Yes, I do. This is great. Okay. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what I what I'd also say as well here is, um, the same presentation you're giving is going to be asked for in almost every single project management company in the world at some point. So the reason to the listeners that we're giving this, steal the presentation, take what Micah has done, do your own slides, and just do it. Like, this doesn't need a thousand people to do a thousand different answers. There's about three answers. So I just say, use this podcast as a shortcut to make yourself look awesome. Yeah, and Greg's going to provide open and candid feedback. He has not seen the presentation before. I've actually not given it before. So we're going to see how this goes. Let me dial this thing up and we can get rolling. How many slides are you doing? Oh, too many. <laughs> oh, is it one of these quick flick ones? Ten second a slide. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I, I really right, like those, it. by the way. I like those loads more because it, it creates the feeling of pace. You know me. I am Mike Pipo. I've done some things. I've worked some places. Uh, we've covered them a lot on this show, so I'm not going to hold on too much to this. But quick shout out and plug for me and Beyond Deadlines. We have a newsletter. We have two different ones. We have a LinkedIn one a email newsletter and you're obviously listening to our podcast so if you want to we're presenting so i would recommend watching this on spotify or youtube because a lot of the slides will be obviously presented on the, the screen and so if you're following along uh on just pure audio it may not catch up to you but there's some qr codes on the screen that you can scan to go through uh, i actually didn't update this slide so i'm going to skip this one <laughs> <laughs> Uh, shout out slides go as well. Uh, that's where I got the format for this. And I think there's a thank you at the end. So beginning, like I said, Greg, we're going to cover definitions and a couple other bits and pieces. So to me, and I wonder if you actually agree with this definition, but data analytics, the process of collecting, organizing, analyzing data to make predictions and inform decisions. I really think that data analytics is geared towards making decisions. What are your thoughts? Um. Data analytics within businesses, yes. And I'll actually just caveat this uh, Caveat this with, if you do a hard science like physics or, or mathematics or engineering, something really, really element of hard science, you've got, um, you've got fundamentally three types of data analytics. You've got one which is hypothetical, so that's theories. So you're just going, I've, I'm just going to plug some numbers together and I'm going to say that um, a system works in this way. You've got, uh, I'm going to bastardize some language, a reg regression one, which means that I'm looking at data that the real world has given me and trying to infer how a system works. And then you've got a prediction. So I've either done one or two, so I've got a theory about a model, or I've inferred data from the real world, and then I'm going to use that to try and, under to try and predict how a system works. And you can gauge the accuracy of a theory by its ability to predict how a system works. Data analytics can sit in any one of those three buckets. So I'd be like, yeah. 
Is it a theory about a financial model you're going to deliver in the workplace? Is it an analysis of actualized data and you're just saying what happened in the past? Or is it a model that's going to try and predict workflow that you can test again? It has to be testable, that, that third yeah. one. Well, where you're going with it, and, and I'll agree on your definitions, and I think you're you're taking, you're getting very detailed and and being you know very clear with your definitions. But I would argue all of those will eventually point to some sort of decision, because yeah. to me, if data for data's sake is a hobby, like yeah. if it's in business and it's on a project, and this is geared towards project management, it should be pointing towards a decision. And and so the key thing is, then what's a project? Ooh, well, actually, let me reverse rings. you. Micah, what's the decision? People might laugh at home and go, Ooh. "We're gonna no, seriously, what's the decision?" We're gonna we're gonna get into that in in a couple of slides, and I'll okay. I'll, 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 just, I'll break that down later, and and maybe based on your feedback, I'll pull it up sooner in the in the definitions place. But uh, if you've ever heard this before, this is a standard ripoff of a definition. It's a temporary a project is a temporary endeavor. It has a defined start and finish date, and it has defined scope and resources. If you're if you're lucky enough to define those. Now, this chart is to represent where, or basically over time, a project creates data. And that's the key thing to keep in mind. So over time, regardless of the project, regardless of what they're doing, you'll start with a little bit of data and over time data will grow. And that happens through cash flow, that happens through scheduling, quality, whatever it is. The if and how the data is used is dependent on what systems and processes people set up as they go through the project. And if you want to dial into specifically on a project, more where data comes from, I don't think you need to look any further than the 10 knowledge areas Ooh, from the PMI. Good, good reference there, by the way, to the yeah, yeah. PM shout out, 10 knowledge shout areas. Out to the no, PMI. People, people don't mention those enough in my mind because it literally is the the design model of projects. Okay, well done. Yeah, I had, I had a project or a, uh, a manager that this is kind of core in his brain whenever we went to solve something that is you know of decent scope is basically what are these 10 areas and how are we going to manage them and they can be managed in different levels of complexity and diligence depending on what mm -hmm. they need but even on a small effort so let's say hey i'm just going to create a new dashboard for the analytics things like well how are you communicating that what's your communication plan so i always really like this but these are roughly you know if you look at a project where data can be generated from now Going back to your, and this isn't the definition of it, but I think how businesses and projects move forward are decisions. Decisions, and I get more into the detailed definition of this, drive action. So a decision is meant to drive action. And really at the root of that is to solve a problem. We'll get to that later. Shout out to Peter Drucker, by the way, effective executive. If you haven't read it, go out and read it. There's different types of decisions out there. And so they can be operational decisions. I'm not going to read all these, but essentially there are a multitude of decisions that go down. And my argument would be if you're going to spend a ton of time creating data analytics to impact decisions, you should look for the biggest and juiciest ones to probably attack for biggest impact. Now, I'm not, I'm not comfortable with the definition of decision, if I'm honest. I, like not, the, I not, very much like the categories. I'm not comfortable yeah, with the definition. Of that's decision. not the full dis definition, though. Did I say it's definition? I, that's just the types. Well, why not, are you telling got... me types of decisions before you give me a definition? You know, because my slides aren't all the way in order. Because the first time, okay, presented. fair enough. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> I'd, I'd pull, I'd pull it to the front because it's just, you know, my OCD is going, yeah. going haywire right now. No, that's we always talk about on this uh, show. If you're going to present anything, practice it first. I just happen to be practicing it in front of. You know, hundreds of people and Craig at the moment. Thousands, actually. Thousands of people now. <laughs> thousands yeah. of people. There are dozens of us. So to, to like, why, uh, why do we focus so much? Why am I focusing so much on decisions? I think they're core to the, uh, they're core to project delivery. And there are numerous things that lead to bad decisions makings. The biggest one to me is just bias and when you make a decision. There are hundreds of these biases out there. You can go research many of them. I've listed a couple of my favorite down here below. Mm -hmm. But essentially, if you're going to make the decision of whether we should start or stop this project, okay, you have inherent bias that you may be bringing to the table. For one, you may be a super optimistic person who thinks we can slam dunk every project. So of course we should start that project, right? 
you may be a person who I always delivered, I've delivered, always delivered my projects on time and nothing's actually ever wrong happened to them. And so I am unique in that aspect, but my uniqueness is why I think we should go deliver this project. And then the other one is like maybe like anchoring. So essentially the latest piece of information you received, oh, well, the last cash flow looked good and the last progress looked good. So that's why we should continue doing the project. And data analytics is there to really help bust those biases and provide you better frameworks of looking at, you know, what could potentially actually happen. Data is here to save you. So the timeline of project and the data, uh, this is, you know, just overall in history, if we want to talk about it, you know, at the very beginning, you had people doing stuff on paper and then computers came in and they were individual and they could solve things. Then information moved to the cloud, and now we're in the age of AI. So over time, you know, our ability to leverage data to make decisions is increasing exponentially. It, it is just going completely off the charts. And then just going a quick tangent, if you've ever heard this podcast before, you heard me talk, exponential growth is just one of those things that's a complete mind bender. So a little riddle for you, Greg, if you, if you would, right? So, and I hope you know the answer to this, but in a pond, there's algae growth. Every day, the patch doubles in size. If it takes 23 days for the growth to cover the entire lake, how long would it take for the algae to cover half the lake? Roughly 22.1 days. Exactly. Exactly. And so I think when you think about how crazy that is, that it's like at one point it's half and then one point it's covered, that's exponential growth. Exponential and growth is a, what is it, 2.23 or something like that, multiple? Yeah. So transition a little bit. Then let's let's see today where some data analytics are used because people are coming from different places out there in the world and different experiences. And I just like to highlight a couple of examples to show what is potential. And especially in construction with technology being kind of delayed in its integration. Let's see just overall a couple of examples where, you know, technology is today. The CEO of Google thinks it's, you know, AI is more important than fire. And so if you're using AI on your data analytics, that's obviously has a profound impact. Arguably, arguably yes. Arguably. arguably. I don't know. Fire... If you've ever had a good steak before, or some nice, well, it's, it's actually the, it's actually the exponential law that you just talked about. Fire had a an impact on hundreds of thousands of people, whereas artificial intelligence is increasing the productivity ex, uh, using a power law on billions of people. Yeah, and so, like you know, rockets land themselves. How does that happen? Well, it happens with a lot of uh, visual based advanced calculations. Right. Mm -hmm. You have sports are one through data now. Soccer, mm -hmm. baseball. There is increasing. Shout out to Moneyball, one of my favorite movies of all time. Shout out to Moneyball and Brad Pitt. Mm -hmm. Cars drive themselves. Now you can get an argument whether they're fully autonomous or partially autonomous. But last time I checked, if you rewind the clock back twenty years, cars were not doing that. Yeah, irrelevant. <laughs> it's not zero. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, money is managed by algorithms. I think it's, you know, anywhere estimated between, you know, a half to two thirds of all money is managed by computers, essentially algorithms. Now people are obviously managing those algorithms, but again, if you rewind the clock back 20, 30 years, there's human beings making these trades, not computers. Uh, the most complex game, not most complex game, but one of the hardest games that people never thought would be beat has been beat by AI. There's an amazing documentary on it. You can go watch it with the, uh, uh, I think it's uh, maybe Netflix or I'll put a link mm. in the show notes. I remember that. And then the other one that obviously is one of the most advanced AIs we've ever seen is literally an app on your phone these days. So at any point in time, you can pull out your phone and ask in a super advanced AI, increasingly complex questions to do loads of things. Mm -hmm. And then on a personal note, you know, you have the ability to create a 5,000 project 
portfolio and database worth an estimated $6 billion and then run analytics on it on yourself. So in a fairly short amount of time, I wrote an article on it. It's on the screen. I'll include it in the show notes. You can go in, have it create for you a synthetic database of any amount of projects you want. You can have it skewed any way you want, and then you can practice running your own analysis on it through ChatGPT. So the world we're living in now is one where the, the, the capabilities you have to perform the data analytics are just completely out of this world. Now, transitioning more, and I think this title slides off again. I got to go fix my title slides. <laughs> But going back to the the definition of data analytics and informed decisions, and getting back to what Greg so adamantly wants to argue about, uh, not argue. It, I've just got my, everyone. Discuss. I've got Mardell CD. Okay, I've got Mardell discuss. CD. Discuss. <laughs> yeah. so, one of my favorite quotes of all time is, and this more this section is more dealing with like the tactics of data analytics. But you know, it, Mr. Lincoln said, "If I'm going to cut down a tree, I'm going to spend most of my time sharpening my axe." And I believe in any sort of problem that you're going to solve or decision you're going to try to make, really sharpening the axe is hands down the best way to spend the vast majority of your time. So what does that look like? If so, if you broke down the steps that we previously presented to do some data analytics, you want to start with the decision. What decision is trying to be made here? Now, I, I know, Greg, you could pop in and say, well, there's sometimes you have this like big, weird sort of data and you don't know what decision you're making. You're just going to like go for it. I, I think those cases are fewer than what most people are probably going to be doing on a project. I, I, actually, I completely agree with you. Like, I own an AI company that analyzes project data. You always start at the decision and you work backwards. And I'll tell you what you get if you don't. You get a bunch of consultancies saying it will take us seven months to structure your data and then we'll be able to start analyzing it. And I'm like, what what kind of trash is that? What what are you what kind of rubbish are you talking here? Give me five days and I'll find you a million of savings and then then we can start to do bigger stuff. I completely agree with you on this. Yeah. And so then like what if you're going through what a decision is to me? You have decision, and if you walk backwards, you have a set of solutions, and those solutions are solving a problem. You know, picking that solution means taking an action, moving forward. You know, if the decision is we want to set, uh, say, five million uh, out of the project, well, what are the solutions that are going to allow us to make that decision? Right? I'm going to select one, two, three, or five, and then there's obviously a problem behind it that solution. And, it, and you know, I guess if I wanted to redraw this, there could be problems behind each solution, but it looks better if you point it to one problem. There is a tendency, though, when you go try and find the problem to stay at the surface level. And so to me, being really, really good at problem diagnosis is a super mm -hmm. important skill to have if you're going to do data analytics. So, you know, in any sort of issue that could come up, like let's say the team is missing deadlines in this example. Well, on the surface level, the symptom is, oh, well, they underestimate the work and their commitments. So, you know, if you're not going to go deeper than that, you could be like, oh, well, you know, maybe they need to be uh, incentivized to make better ones. Maybe they just need a software to solve them better. You know, maybe, uh, you know, whatever it is you could think of to go solve that symptom. But if you go down a step further, you find, hey, maybe the team doesn't actually know the scope of the project that they're estimating. That's why their estimating is bad. Mm -hmm. you know, and so you got to keep digging and digging down until you really chisel out that problem and find like what is that hardcore defined root cause problem. And there's a couple different you know, strategies for that. You can research these online. Five whys, cause analysis, fishbone. My favorite that I've kind of created is a pre-retrospective. And this one, mm -hmm. I love this one, is essentially uh, you have some issue or something that arise, and you basically say, hey, listen, if we go back in time you know, and say, how are we going to be successful next time? How do you then go work through that to ensure that this issue doesn't happen again? And I like doing this in like usually future projects that are coming up, but it can be used on simple data analytics as well. I quite, I quite like the um, pre-mortems. 
So yeah. you get the team together. I just don't say, like okay, being so morbid. So that's why I use pre-retrospective. Yeah. You get the team to say, okay, our job is to destroy this project or business within 24 hours. You've only got 24 hours. How would you go yeah. about doing it? And it has to be legal. Yeah. Because obviously yeah. you can just go burn buildings down. But like, you get, yeah. you'd be surprised how one dark people are. Too. Yeah, well, that's why How I call it retrospective, it Greg. I don't call it a pre mortem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, but there's some really great rocks that you uncover when you do it that way. And it, it also transitions people, you know, out of the I'm looking in front of my feet, you know, and trying getting them to look up at the horizon to go solve problems. So then, out of all of that, you know, now you have the decision. You really want to start all the way at that problem, really define the problem and the collect, organize, and analyze. You know, there are a zillion different tools and techniques that you can go out there and utilize to go figure it out. You know, and so that's where this is going to be unique a little bit towards industry, towards what you're doing. But I feel like if you operated from those first principles of this is going to end in a decision, let's define what the problem is and go collect, analyze, and, and you know try and predict. Now, maybe there's some circles where you fall back to the problem, right? Like you start moving forward and it doesn't quite work out. You get some different data that, you know, I'm not saying you can't run off on a tangent here or kind of circle back, but just starting from that first principle will, I mean, make you so much more effective in data analytics. Uh, now, uh, one other thing is when you start looking at decisions that need to be made, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, uh, it, you probably wouldn't be able to build, I would all call automated or smart decisions in as much as you can now. So figuring out whether you have, are going to build an automated decision or it's going to be a human decision is actually super important because you may just be looking to automate a decision, right? Like, hey, if this invoice doesn't have this sort of stuff in it, we're just going to reject it. Great, we have an automated decision now. If it's something where you're going to then take it to someone and get an approval for, or a human being is going to make it, it it's a, probably just a little bit of a different delivery, and you're going to end up having to sell somebody on your idea. So just, this just is just going, a, just going back yeah, go one. So I, I understand. I understand the point of this, but I think there's a more poignant point kind of underneath underneath the aspects, which is um, there are decisions that matter and the decisions that don't. And I would, I think that's a very, that's a very important thing to note in this, especially when you're getting into data analytics. The decisions that matter are the decisions where you are allocating constrained resources. With constrained resources being calendar time people's time or money and the the bigger the allocation and the more irreversible the allocation the more strategic and important the decision when people talk about strategy what they in my experience what they talk about is large resource allocation that is irreversible so for example mergers and acquisitions when you buy a company you can't unbuy a company and get the, the cash back very Elon strategic. tried, he failed. Yeah. And here, I think, you know, my, my challenge to you would be not all dis not all problems are made equal. You've established that. Not yeah. all decisions are made equal either. If a decision isn't the allocation of substantial constrained resources that are in where it is impractical to get a refund then that's a decision that should be made. If the decision is more simplified, then I'd be saying the problem's not important enough or or, or, you, or the root cause really hasn't been driven out. Yeah. You know, if, if the solution to the problem is to reject an invoice with more than five errors, I'd kind of be like, is that really going to solve the biggest problem? First off, folks, feedback is a gift, and that's why I love doing these sorts of things because you get a, get insights from other people that you're actually giving the presentation to, and it'll help you course correct as needed. I, I completely agree with what you're, what you're saying. That this is where, you know, are you getting something that has high value enough? 
And the interesting part on the invoicing, I'd be like, well, what if we, Greg, we do 10,000 invoices per month and each of them are costing our company 5,000 per invoice to review? Perfect. You know? Perfect. Because you could just go, you could changes. just go, I'm, so the problem, the problem here would be um, off contract leakage. We're losing 3 million a month through off contract leakage and we're having to employ consultants at a million a year to fix it. Yeah. I'd be like, that's a lot of irreversible resources. But going back to your original point, what's missing in here is also is the problem, is the decision that you're trying to go for and the problem that's being stated of high enough value and of importance enough to actually go through the exercise and fix and knowing mm -hmm. if you should. And if it's the case where you said there's like five invoices and this will save the company $100 it's okay to then come back with that analysis and say, this is not a problem worth fixing. If it's the flip of what I said, where this is millions and millions of dollars, and tons of people's constrained time, then it could be worth going out and fixing. The other piece that I, you know, I'm just rephrasing what you said, what is this going to cost the business by making this decision and moving forward? I think, I think as Jeff Bezos famously said, is this a door we can walk through and come back out of? That's not a very important decision. Is this a door we walk through we can't come back out of? And as you said, yeah. buying a company, you can't come back out of that door. We really need to be careful on the decision, the analysis of that decision, and are we addressing the root cause problem that we're trying to solve? So yeah, I think there's some, there's definitely some work here in this, this later uh, stage on kind of decision and decision making. Transitioning a little bit to if you are... And this is where I may go a little off piece. I don't know. I'm kind of still working on the, the very end of this presentation. But I was thinking about if you are going to then go present your information to people, there's just a couple frameworks you should be aware of, you know, like situation, mm -hmm. complication, resolution. And we you structure your, either your presentation or your report, whatever it is that the company is looking for, that medium just to do it in this sort of framework, because it will help you communicate your idea more clearly. There's also a couple I've never, of I've never heard of SCR. I use I use Star and Spin. I've never yeah, heard, I, I like mean, this one. This is a good one. Throw your acronym out there. It all means Star the same Situation, thing. Task, Action, Result, Spin. Yeah. Uh, situation, Problem. Um, I is Impact, and N is Needs, Payoff. So yeah, outcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, to me, it's just pick a framework because that will help you go build this out in a much more efficient manner. And I'd also recommend if you're building a slide deck and you're doing presentation, write it out in a doc first and then go create the slides. There's nothing worse than finishing uh, a slide deck and then having to go redo slides because of, you know, however it is. Uh, and then this actually goes back to what, a little bit what you're talking about earlier is know who's the decision maker mm -hmm. and what their priorities are and what they're looking for and how they, uh, view this. And there's there's loads of different tactics in the corporate world that you can go do about influencing peers of the decision maker, ensuring you come to the table with agreement by getting feedback early and often, and then also understanding is that the actual decision maker. There's loads of meetings I've gone into where stuff was presented and people are looking around like, who's the actual decision maker here? Uh, and so just knowing who that person is will save you loads of time. And then lastly, as we kind of wrap things up here, you know, that piece that I kind of glossed over about the data analytics, you know, to me, the call to action is if you want to get good at data analytics, go do data analytics. You know, if you go back and read my article with ChatGPT and the experience over my career, there's no training, there is no uh, class or course that will help you enough is like find a problem and then go solve the problem mm -hmm. because that will lead you down the road of using the tools that will actually help you the most. You know, for example, you can today go take a SQL class and become very strong in SQL. But if you don't have a problem to solve that revolves around SQL, is that information very useful? Or if you've learned all the basic kind of inputs and formats for it and you go solve your problem, it's not there you're not going to pick it up as a tool and make it very effective. And I think that goes for just about anything. So my encouragement to the audience and the crowd would be go build something. 
go do an extracurricular assignment. Okay? If there's something you're interested and passionate about building, go build it because you're going to pick up far more greater skills. And then lastly, again, shout out to Slides Go for the, the slide deck uh, and all of the, the help. So, Greg, we, we've covered uh, the initial present, I would say draft one of the presentation, initial feedback thoughts. I actually, I actually love, I actually love the ending because you did a presentation about data analytics, and actually you didn't really talk about data analytics. But, <laughs> but the reason, the reason I actually love this is data analytics is a how, the the what is important, and you and I, you and I know categorically that we are in a very high bracket of earning, earners in our industry. We we've done very well. We we're not at the top yet, but we're very we're really not far off. And both you and I know that it is not it is not the specific ability to execute. So it is not the fact that you can code SQL that puts you in that bracket. It is the fact that you can find valuable things and develop solutions to fix them. Including going and finding a person who knows SQL, paying them less than the problem's worth. And I actually think one of the core skills that a large amount of people fail to develop, which is what you know, constrains their earning potential, is this, this problem-focused thinking and decision-focused thinking. All right, you and I know that when we deal with all of the, the SVPs and the VPs and the project directors, they're constantly just thinking, what is the decision I have to make here? And if there's no decision to make, I'm not really interested in knowing any of it. Yeah. So that I really like the end of the present. I really like the fact that actually you talked about how do, how do you do data analytics? Well, actually, it's more a question of how do you find valuable problems? I think I need to do the, the bottom line up front, the bluff, and Maybe make that my yeah. tagline instead of saving it for the uh, for the end. And that's it, the, it's that's the angle I was Who are you presenting to, by the way? Uh, I think it's Boston University. Yeah, but I mean, like, what's the class? Like, who are the people? I mean, it's just an MBA class. Right. So it's people. It's people who can do numbers. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I assume if you're doing an MBA at Boston, you can probably count. Maybe you can even multiply. So yeah. you can do elements of data analytics. Fine. Cool. Yeah. So, yeah. I, okay. Well, that was, I just had this epiphany the other day where I was, I'm trying to get, uh, I have a weekly review thing and instead of paying for some software doing it, I was like, oh, what if I just created a Google form that sent me the form and I punch in the weekly review, it goes into a spreadsheet and then, uh, that's automated. So every week the form comes into my inbox and I don't have to think about it. And then there's some data churning on the back end that happens. And then also in my weekly review, I set out what are my next week's top priorities. Mm -hmm. And I want those emailed to me Monday and Tuesday, because if I do my weekly review on Friday, I have a horrible memory and I will always forget what I said my priorities were for Monday and Tuesday. So if I just get an email, I'll look at it. Okay. Yes. Those are my priorities. Using ChatGPT, it walked me through exactly how to use app script to build that. I literally just typed in my problem, copy and pasted. And now it works perfectly fine. I had tried to use App Script for years. Google's, it's basically how Google's, for people who aren't familiar with App Script, it's basically how Google products can talk to each other with a little bit of code. That blew my mind away to the point where I'm sitting and thinking about the how will become less and less and less difficult. That, that barrier to entry to run that Excel formula or create that thing will just become easier and easier and easier as these assistants be able to come to help you more and more and more. So then if that to me is the easy part, what's the hard part? And to me, it was on the other sides of the scale. What's the decision? What's the problem in the framework go to? So thank you for listening, Greg. I, I really also appreciate your, your feedback on this. It's going to help me I like improve my being, presentation. I like that you're being kind. He's being kind, everyone, because we're, uh, we're recording a podcast. He would still thank me, but he'd use more crude language if we weren't recording. <laughs> Oh, never. Absolutely not. 
Absolutely not. Well, folks, that wraps it up for this week. We value your time, so we try to keep these shows short and hard-hitting. As I mentioned before, if you're liking this content, please hit the subscribe button. Please share with other people who may find these topics valuable. And feel free to reach out to us on LinkedIn and recommend any topic you'd like to hear. We've had several recommendations, and we're trying to work through that list as we go forward. For us on Beyond Deadlines, thanks, and we'll see you again next week. Bye.